second and study third, which had the British Columbia in Camp 1983. This 11 presentation on Sabbath morning. We'll come back now to Matthew chapter 18 to continue our consideration of the spirit of love and the spirit of forgiveness. This servant, working for his master, had incurred an enormous debt. He owed his master 10,000 talents. And when my Bible was printed, they said in the margin that a talent was worth about $1,200. And 10,000 talents of that value then would be something like $12 million in debt. But today, with the, of course, deflation of money values, uh, and the inflation of costs and so forth, we could say something more like in terms of 15 to 20 million dollars. Now that is indeed an enormous debt. If you'd like to sit down and do some quick calculations as to how long you take to pay that back at, shall we say, 100 dollars per week, it's a very, very long period of time lasting centuries. Without, of course, pardon? That would be the current interest. Well, I guess without the interest element. The interest of 10% of course would be uh, 120,000 dollars per year, and 100 dollars would be only on the uh, 50,000, isn't it? Uh, no, 5,000 a year. That's right, 5,000 a year. So that, without the interest, of course, you never look like paying a, paying the principal of it, alone paying the interest if there was interest added in as well. Now, very obviously, of course, God is the owner or the king in the story, and who is the servant? Every one of us. Every single one of us. I'm sorry. Bite the phones. Hmm. Shall I start again? Got to put this microphone on. Well, in the parable, of course, God is the king, and the servant represents every single one of us. And the debt which has been incurred, of course, is a debt occasioned by our sin back in the Garden of Eden. Now, how much power does any human being have to pay off the debt we owe to God, or more, more, more correctly, the, the broken law? How much power do we have? None. Even though we might uh, attain to perfect righteousness ourselves, even that would not atone for the enormous debt which we owe to the law, and turn to the God who made us in the first case. Now in the story, when this man is confronted with this enormous debt, what was his first reaction? He said, have patience and I will pay the all. Just give me time and I'll pay it all. Now is this the first natural reaction of the human being when he, when he becomes convicted of, the sin, of his sins? It certainly is, very much so. In fact, many people cherish the idea consciously or subconsciously they must first of all make themselves good they must first reform their lives they must put away their sins they must begin to work the works of righteousness before they can come into God's presence in the first instance when I was in California way back about 1965 and 1966 I gave some studies there and stressed the point in one of them that we must come to Christ just as we are don't try and make yourself good don't try and pay the debt back yourself but come just as you are into the presence of God for him to do for you what you can't do for yourself and I assume that uh, I was labouring a point unnecessarily that every person in my audience should surely have understood the fact that we come to God just as we are and leave his work of grace to make the transformation but to my amazement, when the study was over, one man came to me and said, well, that's the first time I knew that, he said. I always believed, most devoutly, that I had to reform my life and make myself good before Christ could accept me. Which, of course, is a self-defeating task. It can't be achieved anyway. And so this man had to learn the lesson, and the king, of course, knowing the man couldn't possibly pay, as any little bit of logic would soon demonstrate, said to him, I forgive you everything. Now let's read the exact words in verse uh, 27. Then the Lord of that servant was moved with compassion and loosed him and forgave him the debt. Now we need to appreciate today to what extent that forgiveness is given to us when we truly confess our sins we're told in the spirit of prophecy in very plain terms that we then stand before God as if we had never sinned at all. 
The first reference I'll read is from Steps to Christ, page 62, where the statement says, Christ's character stands in place of your character and you're accepted before God just as if you had not sinned. You are accepted before God. Now ponder those words. You are accepted before God, for you stand before God just as if you had not sinned. Now, another statement from First Selected Messages, page 367, says, Christ's righteousness is accepted in the place of man's failure, and God receives, pardons, justifies the repentant, believing soul, treats him as though he were righteous, and loves him as he loves his son. In other words, when God forgives us, he then maintains it maintains toward us an attitude the same as that attitude would be if we'd never committed a single sin. Now you think of this in terms of our earthly relationships today and you've known people that, uh, with whom you've had very good fellowship, you've met, a, you've met a person, you made a friend of that person for a period of time, you've had with that person a very, very nice relationship. You got along well together, you loved each other, there was, there was no feeling of distrust, no feeling of animosity or anger toward each other, and then came the unhappy day when that person sinned against you, either wittingly or unwittingly. And what happened to your attitude? to the change? You became suspicious, you became mistrustful, you began to feel that you had to exhibit uh, a certain aloofness by way of demonstrating your disapproval of that person's actions, and, and so forth. So a, there was a difference between how you felt toward that person after that person sinned and before that person sinned against you. And then that person came to you and, um, and pleaded your forgiveness. Said that, that person said, that, well, I'm sorry. And um, we, sort of, we sort of forgave. We said, yes, well, I, I know I should forgive and I do forgive you, but even after the forgiveness was over, did we now feel toward that person after we had forgiven them as we felt before they'd sinned. Now, that's how God feels, doesn't he? He feels the same after and relates himself the same after the forgiveness as he did before we sinned in the first case. Of course, there never was a time when we, when we were sinless. We were born sinful, but let's talk in terms of Adam before he sinned and Adam after he sinned and God treated him as though he had never sinned at all. Now we don't fully appreciate this truth, I'm sure. I think you'll find, as I now describe, um, the average approach that we make toward God after we have confessed our sins. In other words, we sin, we sin against God very deeply. We uh, do something that's evil and wrong. Later we repent of that thing and we come to God and ask his forgiveness. But don't we tend to go around then carrying with us a feeling that God says, yes, I forgive you, but I haven't forgotten what you did back there. Don't we tend to carry that feeling toward God? Well, we carry that feeling towards ourselves too. And toward God. Right, and toward ourselves as well, right? Now, do we do God true honour and justice to do that? When we, we don't, we, we, because we haven't come to really appreciate the miracle of God's forgiving love, which is so magnificent, so beautiful and so complete, that in the most literal and complete sense of the word, we stand before him after we have been forgiven as if we had never committed our sin at all. In other words, God's attitude toward us is just as beautiful and powerful and wonderful after we have been forgiven as it was before, before we committed the sin. Now, if we are to forgive as God forgives us, then how shall we know that we have truly forgiven that person? We shall know it when we, when we find in ourselves the same love toward that person, the same trust in that person, the same spirit of, um, of oneness with that person that, that we had before that person committed that sin. Now, for instance, um, in a distant country from here, not in America, but um, in, in one, of, one of the lands around the world, I won't particularly mention which one, doesn't matter. I just want to tell the story. There was a family of believers in a certain city and um, they loved the message just as you folk do. And in time they reached out and would rejoice to gather in another family to fellowship with them from Sabbath to Sabbath. And they had a wonderful time together for a period of several months. Now it so happened that he had a 
young daughter of about 17 or 18 years of age and the other family had a son of about 19 or 20 years of age and as seems to happen sometimes they got together became friends with each other and eventually taught in terms of uh, getting married and uh, the, the parents on both sides were not very happy about this, this match both parents felt it wasn't uh, desirable for, I don't know why but they had their own reasons I suppose and um, the parents disagreed about the matter the, the, the two sets of parents disagreed about the matter especially the mother in one and the father in the other until there was a tremendous showdown at last and uh, a great rift was developed where previously there had been good fellowship well eventually the, um, the man and his family they left the city and went to live a long way away from there while the other family stayed on in their own location in due time I came to visit the family in which the mother had been the main cause of difficulty and um, I had hardly arrived when she remembered all these bad things that in her judgment were bad I'm not judging the situation at all, I'm, I'm just saying bad in, in her terms that this other man had done to her and, and, she, and I, could, I could detect a real taste of bitterness and resentment and anger in her voice and I said to her well haven't you forgiven him oh yes I've forgiven him <laughs> she said I've forgiven him and so I took out this parable and gave them a Bible study on this parable and demonstrated to them that demonstrated what the spirit of forgiveness really involves now I said to her do you think back to when you first met this family and you had good fellowship with that family and think back to your feelings toward the man of the other house and that was the feeling of brotherly and sisterly love and how you enjoyed studying the word of God together and fellowshipping together on Sabbath and how there was har harmony between those two families now I said do you today feel the same way now as you felt back then and of course she had to admit she did it but there was a vast difference between how she felt back then and how she felt now toward that family so I related to her from the word of God how God feels to us after we have been forgiven um, and how he relates to us before we've been forgiven and I said now the word of God said we are to forgive as we have been forgiven we are to forgive as we have been forgiven and the statement plainly says in verse 35 the last verse in the chapter that so likewise shall my heavenly father do also unto you if you from your hearts forgive not every man or every one his brother their trespasses now the, the, the strong three words in that sense are from your heart if you don't forgive from your heart from a heart of love from a heart of divine love placed in us by the power of God's spirit then what's going to happen our sins will roll back upon us as if we had never been forgiven at all because this servant in the parable after he had received this wonderful forgiveness and think about it those 15 to 20 million dollars had been so totally forgiven he stood before the king as if he never owed a cent and what more could the king do than that that's total forgiveness and that man uh, could rest assured that never again would he face that uh, responsibility again the debt was so completely forgiven from him and the king forgot about it as far as the king was concerned he was an honest servant who owed him nothing and which in fact of course he did he owed him nothing but that man went out and met a person who owed him a hundred pence wasn't it and according to most of my bible that's about seventeen dollars uh, then say shall we say about twenty five dollars today allowing for inflation since this bible was printed and that was of course just an approximate figure now what's twenty five dollars versus twenty million dollars where's the comparison but the strange thing is this that in the mind of that servant the money owed to him was m of more consequence and more moment than what he owed to his master and if you think about it very carefully that's a true picture of the human attitude toward their sins now for instance when we go before God and confess our sins to him and he forgives us for those sins that's, that's a very wonderful blessing and when someone sins against us then in our minds or in the average person's mind which is the more important the more consequential what other people do against us or what we've done against God which do we think is the greatest sin 
Pardon? Pardon? And say what other people have done against That's right. Now you study people's conversations and their talk and they'll they'll confess their sins, they won't talk about that anymore. That's 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 only a small thing. But what other people have done to them, you find people talk for hours and hours and hours about other folk have done against them. So just as in this servant's mind that that twenty dollars or twenty five dollars was of far greater importance and far greater magnitude than the twenty million dollars he owed his master, I suppose he said to himself, Well, the king he's rich anyway, what's twenty million dollars to him? He's got a few hundred million more, so what's twenty million dollars to him? But I'm just a poor man, so what's seventeen million dollars to seventeen or twenty five dollars to me? And that became the by far the more important thing. But in real facts, in real facts, in real values, which is the greater debt? What what other people owe to us or what we owe to God? Which is the greater debt? Right. Now in in putting figures on this, like twenty million dollars versus twenty five dollars. That's why I think that those figures give an accurate picture because how can we begin to estimate our debt to God that is really infinite, isn't it? And the measure of our debt to God is, is revealed in the price that God had to pay to get that debt paid, which of course is the life of God himself in the person of Jesus Christ. And, and inasmuch as Christ is greater than all the universe put together, then obviously of course the debt is greater than, um, than all the universe put together. Now when this man then enforced upon this person the payment of that debt, in other words when he manifests an unforgiving spirit toward his fellow man, then the king called him in and rolled the first debt back upon him so totally it was now as if he'd never been forgiven for it in the first case. Now then Jesus said to us, says to us, so likewise shall my heavenly Father do also unto you if you from your hearts forgive not everyone his brother their trespasses. Now this is rather a serious message, isn't it? Because our hope of eternal life depends upon our having what? The power of God's forgiving love in our hearts. And uh, we do well to meditate now upon our past and ask us, and just think about your present enemies, the ones who've sinned against you and done evil against you, and if you find at this present time that you have perfect peace toward that person, that you bear him not the slightest grudge or ill will, that you have in your heart a totally forgiving spirit toward that person, that you love that person as if they'd never done you wrong, then what have you got in your heart? The spirit of forgiving love. And you're forgiving as God has forgiven you. And if you've forgiven as God has forgiven you, then he will have forgiven you. But if you can't forgive as God forgives you, then what happens to all your debt? It comes back upon your head as if you had never been forgiven, and what hope do we then have of eternal life? The answer is none. Now some folk may have trouble with this because um, they fail to distinguish between um, love without fellowship and love together with fellowship. A number of years ago, well it was quite a number of years, about ten years ago now, I had gone to Germany and at the camp meeting in Starkenburg, which is not too far from Heppenheim in central Germany, I had uh, given some days an acceptable confession and um, a number of folk from Hanover had uh, heard this message and had gone away and put it, put it into practical use. Now, it so happened that they were working with worldly colleagues or associates and these worldly folk of course uh, had different standards, different interests, different objectives in life and, and as time went by they developed a very very deep rift between the, our believers and these worldly folk. So I said that a spirit of resentment and hatred and even a quarrel or two developed and there was not a very happy situation. But our believers went home and they confessed before God that in them was a spirit of resentment and hatred. They didn't love their enemies. They gave God the problem, asked him to remove their evil spirit and to give them the spirit of Christ. And they said they found that there was a total, that the, that the old spirit of evil just disappeared from them and was gone. But they said, we don't find that we are really enjoying their company any better. We don't find that um, we, we can uh, feel a great love toward them and we just feel that somehow we've got half the, half the blessing and the other half the blessing. Well, I said, think about it for a moment. How can you possibly expect to have fellowship with people whose interests are so different from your own? What do those people enjoy that you enjoy? 
And the answer is nothing. They talk about different subjects, they have different places, they have different ambitions, they have different uh, procedures. So how can you have fellowship between light and darkness? You cannot, as Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, what fellowship has Christ with Belial or righteousness with unrighteousness? So come out and be separate from them. It's very obviously, of course, that when you have two Christians, two members of this movement, and something has happened, Satan has brought in a wedge between you, and you both kneel upon your knees and enter into the spirit of forgiving love so that you can now approach each other as if nothing had ever happened and there's not the slightest shadow of stain upon your experience with each other and because you share the same interests and have the same love, loves and objectives and standards and so forth you now have love together with fellowship and what is more lovely and more beautiful than that? There's nothing is there. Love with fellowship is the most, most desirable thing that human beings can ever have. But then on the other hand, you, you may have another person who is not of this message and God puts into you the spirit of forgiving love toward that person. So it's your only desire now to do that person good, to return good for evil, to love him and to pray for him and so forth. But you can't have fellowship with that person and what is more painful than deep love deprived of fellowship? What is, more, what is worse than that? There's nothing worse than that, is there? So... If we, if we understand this distinction, we'll find that um, we'll be saved a lot of troubled thoughts because we'll then understand that we can't expect more than we've got, namely, love without fellowship means that while we have no resentment toward that person, we certainly will have love toward that person. And you'll be happy to know that the lady to whom I presented these thoughts in, in a faraway land, who had cherished these feelings of resentment toward this other person, did get the point, did go away and make her peace with God, and I've never ever heard her complain about this other brother since, most of my relief. Because I found it a very distressing experience to have her continually talk to her, talking about what this person had done to her, instead of looking away from self and selfishness and letting the peace of God fill her heart and life. Now, <clears throat> this is the kind of spirit that the Philadelphian believers will develop, and in fact must develop. Because remember that during the closing scenes of the ministry of the fifth angel, then during the end time of the seven last plagues, when Jacob's trouble is coming to his conclusion, through God's people, the one for the thousand, must be given an unlimited revelation of God's character, a revelation just as clear, just as searching, just as broad, just as deep as that given by Jesus Christ himself upon Calvary's cross. And today, of course, we are just beginning to experience and to appreciate how sweet and lovely that experience is as we learn to love each other more and more deeply day by day. But we have yet to realise the full scope of that love and very obviously the life of Jesus Christ upon this earth is the revelation of that love. So the more we behold that matchless love, the more we shall be in turn elevated in thought, purified in heart and transformed in character. So the very words of our, um, of, our, um, um, of, of our church name, that is the church name, the symbolic church name, Philadelphia, is to be in itself a revelation to us of what God plans that we shall be and certainly will bring us to be before all things are brought to their conclusion. Now before I say more about Philadelphia and bodily love, I want to go on to the statement made in the next part of the verse which says these things says he that is holy now who is he that is holy obviously this is Christ you may remember from last year's presentation in the book of Revelation when we went uh, through in California and Puyallup up uh, the message of the seven churches that Jesus Christ was always presented to each church in a different way but in such a way as exactly met the need of that church and when we realise that, of course, we'll appreciate the fact that the Philadelphians especially need a revelation of Jesus Christ as the Holy One. All right then, now let's just quickly make a, a very short review of this point to emphasise it to our minds this morning. For instance, we find in Revelation 2 verse 1 that to the Ephesus church, Christ appeared as the one who held the seven stars in his right hand and who walked in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. In the book Acts of the Apostles again we find some very, very um, interesting comments on, on this um, particular point. I turn now to page uh, 500 and, uh, 
85, I believe it to be. No, not quite right yet. Page 587, Acts the Apostles. Actually, go back to 586 and across to page 587. Because this point is a very important one in our lessons during this week, I'll read this one paragraph again today. I say again because we read it last year a couple of times. These things that he did hold of the seven stars in his right hand. Now when you hold something in your right hand, what is that something? It's under your control, isn't it? Under your guidance, because the right hand is the instrument through which most of us do our work, and what's in our right hand is guided and controlled by our right hand. Something like left-handed, mind you, but um, here it says the right hand. These words were spoken to the teachers in the church, those entrusted by God with, with, with weighty responsibilities. The sweet influences that are to be abundant in the church are bound up with God's ministers who are to reveal the love of Christ. The stars of heaven are under his control. He fills them with light. He guides and directs their movements. If he did not do this, they would become fallen stars. So with his ministers, they are but instruments in his hand and all the good they accomplish is done through his power. Through them his light is to shine forth the Saviour is to be their efficiency. Now comes the key sentence with this word as once more and I've learned to look for and recognise the presence of the word as as a guideline to how we are to behave. It says if they will look to him as he looked to the Father they will be able to do his work. As they make God their dependence he will give them his brightness to reflect to the world. Now did the church at Ephesus need that kind of message? Let your mind go back to the study we gave in the um, series on Sabbath rest. It's found in the book on Sabbath rest too. There's a chapter there entitled the Problems in the Early Church and the next chapter is called Another Reversion. And we saw there how that in the early Christian church there were two mighty, uh, what should I call them, um, principles at war with each other. And what were those two principles? One was the mystery of God and the other the mystery of iniquity. And who was the champion of the mystery of God? Paul was. And who was the champion, or who were the champions for the mystery of iniquity? Right, the leaders in Jerusalem. You know, I've been surprised to find that some people think that those leaders in Jerusalem were the other apostles. The, the other 11 apostles. No, they were not. They were, the other apostles were not involved in this, um, in this spirit of those leaders. They were, they were leading men amongst them who was James, the brother of Jesus, not James the Apostle but James the brother of Christ and they warred against the principles that Paul was standing for now for the church at Ephesus to maintain their relationship to God then the ministers in that church as well as the people in that church had to be stars in Christ's hand and therefore under Christ's control that was critically essential for, their, for that church to go on being a successful church in the, in the work of God now <clears throat> And also the fact that Christ walked up and down the midst of the seven golden candlesticks revealed his presence as the minister of the sanctuary at God's right hand through the open door to the holy place by which every power necessary for the completion of God's work was available to his ministers down here upon this earth. I greatly appreciate the promise contained on page 258 in the book Education for wisdom and power to do his work when they ask and receive it by faith and therefore in fact. Now I don't want to launch into a detailed study of the various presentations of Jesus Christ. I do want to emphasise the point that to each church Christ appeared in a different way and that different way was exactly what that church needed. Look for instance in chapter 2 verse 8 and under the church, the angel of the church in Smyrna write these things saith the first and the last which was dead and is alive. Now the Smyrna church was one which followed the Ephesus church and the time came when tremendous persecution and loss of life was experienced by the Christian believers. Now as these folk went down to their martyrs' graves, then what presentation of Christ would best encourage and support them? Naturally, are they crucified and risen Saviour? And that's exactly how Christ was presented before them. And to the Pergamos church which followed, the church of deep dark apostasy, Christ was then presented as the living word who therefore had the answers to their problem and could have, could have turned their apostasy into loyalty one more time. 
the foreign church he's revealed as the glorious one with the eyes like flame of fire and feet like fine brass to the Sardis church again as the one who had the seven stars in his right hand to the Philadelphian church now he is revealed there as the one that is holy now I must confess that I, I have been greatly surprised and, and, and richly blessed as I have come to understand exactly what holiness is in scriptural terms. Let's turn to Acts the Apostles page 51 and this statement now is one which is going to be a term of reference for the studies that will follow during the several days of this week and we'll confine ourselves to this term, these terms of reference quite closely. Page 51 in the book Acts the Apostles. It is not a conclusive evidence that a man is a Christian because he manifests spiritual ecstasy under extraordinary circumstances. Holiness is not rapture. Okay, so there's the first point, it is not rapture. If it's not rapture, and what is rapture by the way? Emotional excitement, isn't it? A grand flush of feeling. It's being carried away into the seventh heaven and, uh, and uh, being almost detached from all reality. And when people get a great feeling in a meeting, they, they become uh, excited and worked up and uh, they have great feelings of love and praise to God, they think they have been enraptured and that they have become holy. Now what is it then? Now I'm going to, it, it is two things. And we're, we're going to look today for a single word to describe the first three sentences and a single word to describe the next three sentences or clauses. But they're really sentences that have been enclosed in semicolons. Right, now you listen carefully and as I read the first three sentences, come back with one word that covers those three sentences. It is an entire surrender of the will to God. It is living by every word that proceedeth from the mouth of God. It is doing the will of our Heavenly Father. One word. Pardon? I didn't catch it. Again? No, no, one word which, which describes uh, what those three sentences say. That's what I'm looking for, one word. Submission. Submission is a good word, but not quite the word I'm... Pardon? Commitment, right, surrender. Obedience is the word, right? That's the word, obedience. So now let's read it again. It is an entire surrender of the will to God. That is submission, true. And we'll use the word submission quite a bit during this week, but it's also obedience, isn't it? That is obedience. It is living by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Is that obedience? Right. It is doing the will of our Heavenly Father. Is that obedience? Right. Now again, we want a second word now to cover the next three sentences in like manner. It is trusting God in trial, in darkness as well as in the light. It is walking by faith and not by sight. It is relying upon God with unquestioning confidence and resting in His love. One word. Pardon? Faith. Faith. Right. So in two words, what is holiness? It's obedience and faith, right? It's those two things. Now, we've learned from the Sabbath rest principles, of course, that uh, obedience involves a very specific relationship to God, and faith likewise is something very specific. As Sister White says in Education 257, that in the prayer of faith, and you can't, of course, separate prayer from faith, that is true prayer from faith, in the prayer of faith there is a divine science, it's a science which everyone who makes his life with a success must understand. So we're talking in terms of obedience in very specific lines because all too many folk will come up to the last day and say, Lord, Lord, have we not done many wonderful things in your name? We've cast out devils, we've done this, we've done that, and they'll think that what they have done is obedience. But what will Christ say? You workers of iniquity or you workers of disobedience. So what those folk will think is obedience, God will classify as disobedience. And the last thing we want, of course, is to render what we think is obedience and end up being told that our obedience was nothing else than disobedience, right? Now then, if you want to know, if you want to know then how to uh, be holy or to be obedient and faithful or faith-filled or be filled with faith, then to whom do we look as the model of obedience and faith or holiness? Christ. Christ is the Holy One and therefore he is the obedient and the faithful one and during this week we'll go to the life of Christ 
and we'll look to see how in that life there is a manifestation of these great and wonderful qualities. Now, I'll turn now to another statement in Desire of Ages in this connection and we'll be, um, perhaps I won't for the moment, I might spoil something I'm going to bring up a little later. We'll we'll come back um, to that point uh, after I've looked at the story in the experience of Christ and his disciples. Let's turn now to the story of that dreadful night on the lake when Jesus Christ slept in the bottom of the boat and the apostles disturbed his sleep because they were afraid that they had um, that they were going to perish. And I want to get far enough in this in the next eight minutes to leave that question in your minds to be thought about during the time between this and the next study period. Right, we'll turn to Mark the fourth chapter, verses thirty five to forty one, and we'll read the story as as it, as, as it is given in the Bible. Mark the fourth chapter. Actually there are in every single gospel except John, as Matthew, Mark and Luke, this story is related. So it must have been rather an important one in the minds of those disciples. Now verse 30 begins the story in earnest, I think. Um, now let's start with verse 36. And when they had sent away the multitude, they took him even as he was in the ship, and they were also with him other little ships. And there arose a great storm of wind, and the waves beat into the ship, so it was now full. And he was in the hind part of the ship, asleep on a pillow. And they awake him and say unto him, Master, carest thou not that we perish? And he arose and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. And he said unto them, Why are you so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? And they feared exceedingly and said one to another, What manner of man is this that even the wind and the, wa- and the sea obey him? Right, now, if I was to um, ask you, does the story of Christ upon that lake with those disciples, does that teach us a very clear lesson in holiness and how does it teach it? You might perhaps say, well, we can't really see it at, the, at this present point of time. Maybe you can. But um, it does. And this is a very wonderful story to teach us some vital principles in respect to what a holy life will do and be, what is true faith and true obedience in this particular context. Now, let's come back to the Zion of Ages then. We'll look at, at the context to see what took place as a preamble to this experience page 333 in the book Desire of Ages <clears throat> the chapter is called Peace Be Still it's the 35th chapter in the, in the book now I want to read this context because it um, does have a very close bearing on the events which took place thereafter I find that very often Jesus Christ would lay down certain principles and then the events which took place after that teaching were designed to test and to test the faith of those who heard what he taught. I now read, It had been an eventful day in the life of Jesus. Beside the Sea of Galilee, he had spoken his first parables by familiar illustrations, again explaining that to the people the nature of his kingdom and the manner in which it was to be established. Now don't overlook that sentence. Christ that day through all these various parables explained the nature of his kingdom and the manner in which it was to be established. And what took place upon the lake a few hours later was a testing of that teaching to see if the disciples would understand and practice what they had learned during that long day of listening to Jesus Christ. But we find, of course, they did not because Christ said to them, Why are you afraid? How is it that you have no faith? Back in Matthew he says, how come you have so little faith? Here he says, no faith at all. Now, if Christ then rebuked them with those words, how much commendation do you find in verse 40 for those disciples? Why are you so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? How much commendation? Not a word of it. It's all condemnation, isn't it? Every bit of it. So therefore the course they followed was a violation of the principles of faith and therefore obedience and their course was holy or was it unholy? Unholy, Unholy, right? It was unholy. 
and a natural question arises what should they have done um, let me just put that question in mind before time is gone for me completely a little further over on page 334 it says that those hardy fishermen had spent their lives upon the lake and had guided their craft safely through many a storm but now their strength and skill availed nothing they were helpless in the grasp of the tempest and hope failed them as they saw their boat was filling alright now ask yourself the question what should they have done they start to row the boat across the lake and they get halfway across and a dreadful storm suddenly assails them again and again in the past they had met similar storms and none quite so furious as this one they had used their skill and their strength to, to, to fight the storm they had been always successful before and had always brought the boat safely to shore and had escaped from being drowned but now as they row, row across, the boat, across the lake this storm is worse than the other ones and they do the same thing as before but without getting the same results now what should they have done? that's the question I thought to myself yesterday as I was flying from uh, Walla Walla to here once I reached the Cascades there was an unbroken sea of cloud below me there was no holes down below and I thought to myself now what would I do now if the engine quit? <laughs> because the plane would only go down it wouldn't, it wouldn't, it would glide down, I could glide for quite a distance but I know that, that those clouds were, were wrapped around the mountain peaks below and I would, wouldn't be able to see them if I hit them so what should I do? and my mind went back to those disciples and I knew I would have to do, if I'd be faithful to God, what they should have done now what should they have done? that's the question I want you to think about between now and our next study period I thought about it for months before I got the answer and when I got the answer, it was a very, very blessed answer indeed, which we'll certainly share in our next study period. What should they have done? Well, they seem to have done the obvious thing, don't they? They flung their weight upon the oars and did their little best to bring that boat to shore with all their strength and power. But what they did do was not what they ought to have done, otherwise Christ would never have said to them, Oh, you of little faith, wherefore did you doubt? Why were you afraid? So come back now to page 333 I'll leave the question right there in your minds as I read now a little further He likened his own work to that of the sower the development of his kingdom, kingdom to the growth of the mustard seed and the effect of leaven in the measure of meal The great final separation of the righteous and the wicked he had pictured in the parables of the wheat and tares in the fishing net The exceeding preciousness of the truths he taught had been illustrated by the hidden treasure and the pearl of great price but in the parable of the householder he taught his disciples how they were to labour as his representatives all day he had been teaching and healing and as evening came on the crowd still pressed upon him day after day he administered to them scarcely pausing for food or rest the malicious criticism and misrepresentation with which the Pharisees constantly pursued him made his labours much more severe and harassing and now the close of the day found him so utterly wearied that he determined to seek retirement in some solitary place across the lake and they boarded the boat he gave the command rode to the other side and they began their momentous journey Christ himself quickly falling asleep on the bottom of the boat leaving his apostles to guide that boat with unerring accuracy until they were struck by the storm and then tried to bring that boat to shore and as we shall see what they did of course was a very very clear violation of principles of holiness in the worst kind of way and yet they did what we would probably do in the same circumstances right time is gone so I'll leave it at that point and seeing I've been choosing all the wrong hymns I'll let you folks choose the hymns down so you can pick one that you know so anyone who likes to pick a closing hymn speak up and we'll sing that hymn Three nine four, three nine four. Yes, that's a well known hymn. 